So uh, welcome everybody uh, to the sort of third day of this um, winter AI school. Um, as we've discussed before, each of these uh, modules are designed to be standalone. We have the first hour um, or so, which is a lecture uh, covering aspects of the physics and the machine learning that's been employed. And then it's very much for the second hour and a half, or, second hour and a half, uh, there will be an opportunity to use a workbook uh, specifically designed to illustrate aspects of uh, machine learning used in physics. You will need a Google um, uh, account in order to run the free Python notebook service. You can reach the all of the material, including the lecture uh, slides and the um, PDF, uh, sorry, and the Google Colab uh, 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 Python notebook is all on a Google Drive that is linked directly from the Indigo, which is the, uh, you know, the main system that you registered uh, on. And the link is available on the front sheet uh, there. Each module is listed separately under, you know, the quite obvious title, uh, you know, for each session. So uh, I'd now like to sort of, uh, oh, there is, sorry, in Slack, I must mention, there is also a link to a Slack. If you are having any technical difficulties um, uh, while you're running or getting notebooks mounted or something like that, you can try shout, you know, see if you uh, shout into the Slack system. We'll be keeping an eye on that. Uh, and then in addition, if you have uh, questions related directly to the speaker, do please free, feel free to use the chat. Uh, or the, sorry, excuse me. Do feel free to use the chat or the Q and A system on this uh, on this Zoom. Anyway, I, I'll at this point throw it over to um, uh, uh, you know uh, to Lucas and Jennifer and Matt who are going to be uh, uh, holding this session this morning. And thank you once again, everybody, for attending. Thanks a lot, Rick. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen again. Um... You should be able to see my slides now and hear me well, I hope. Um, and I just want to hide Zoom so that I can see myself. Good. OK, so thanks, everyone, for connecting um, once again. So this morning, we're going to be talking about boosted top tagging at the LHC. Um, maybe some of you have heard about um, top quarks and tagging them um, at the LHC. Maybe you haven't. Hopefully, by the end of today, you'll know a little bit more about it either way. Um, the structure of the uh, module for this morning, um, we've split it into three parts. So we'll actually have a bit of the interactive session um, sprinkled throughout it. Um, so right now, um, before we get started, we know that there are a lot of people connected here who may not actually have a particle physics background. Um, maybe you're from another field or you haven't had a chance to take particle physics yet. So we wanted to give um, the first part of the lecture is mostly context and motivation. It's a bit of a grab bag of different concepts, which will come back up um, later in the day, um, mostly physics related. Um, if by the end of this, um, you're you know, confused um, and sad, please don't stay that way for long. Um, hopefully you won't be, <laughs> but if you are, um, the second part will um, get down to some more um, concrete things um, and include a bit of hands-on material, and then we'll get um, fully absorbed by the machine in the third part with the sort of modern day machine learning techniques at the LHC. So to get started, um, I'm a particle physicist. Um, on this slide, I've put a few um, of the big questions in sort of 21st century particle physics, I think. Um, questions like these are you know, one of the reasons that I decided to pursue physics as a career. Some of you may be interested in questions like what is the nature of dark matter? Or why is there more matter than antimatter in the universe? And as a particle physicist, um, we try to advance our knowledge uh, and answer questions like these by studying particles and their properties. If you want to answer big questions, um, it can be helpful to have a big machine. So hopefully some of you connected have heard about the Large Hadron Collider. Um, this is a 27 kilometer long um, Hadron Collider. We produce proton-proton um, collisions and also heavy ion collisions with it. It's sited at CERN. 
So you can see this aerial shot um, of the countryside of France and Switzerland um, near Geneva and the Alps in the background. Um, the LHC is actually located 100 meters under the ring that is shown, the orange ring in this picture. Um, so in reality, it's something a bit more like the inset here. Um, I've collected a number of um, fun facts and figures about the LHC. Um, the most relevant ones today are that um, at the LHC, we produce the highest center of mass energy particle colliss collisions in a laboratory um, that have been produced to date. This has been true since it was turned on in 2010. Um, and the center of mass energy has been increased a couple of times since then. Now it's running at 13.6 tera electron volts um, center of mass energy in the proton proton collisions. So it produces very high energy collisions, and also it produces a lot of collisions. So um, about a billion collisions per second of 40 megahertz um, rate nominally at the LHC. Um, and this results in a very large data set that we can use to do physics. And we have been doing um, physics with this data again for over a decade now. So in case you have not been following um, particle physics for the last 15 years or so since the LHC um, took center stage, I can catch you up uh, <laughs> with this slide that I've borrowed from uh, Mikhail Kramer, um, who actually gave the closing talk at a machine learning for um, particle physics conference that um, happened last year. Um, so here he made a couple of statements. So basically, at the LHC, we've confirmed the standard model with high accuracy up to energy scales of a few TeV. Um, we discovered a particle um, which has properties consistent with those of the Higgs boson that was predicted by the standard model. And there has not yet been a conclusive sign of new physics, um, something beyond the standard model, let's say, um, that has been found in the LHC data. So he concludes a couple of things. The first is that new physics um, could be heavy. So it could be so heavy that um, we can't make it at the LHC. Hopefully we can though. Um, he says also that new physics could be subtle. So it could be something rare or it could manifest in a way that we haven't thought about looking for it. Um, so today we're going to be thinking mostly about heavy um, new physics scenarios. So these are um, the types of new physics models that can give you boosted objects and actually by looking for boosted top quarks, like we're going to be talking about today, this is one of the ways that we have um, managed to search this sort of high mass region at the LHC um, so thoroughly. Um, if new physics was subtle, of course, you might want to use some of the techniques that Greg and Lucas were talking about yesterday in the anomaly detection um, module. And of course, you can always mix and match these. You could have heavy, subtle signatures as well. So this diagram summarizes the standard model of particle physics. Um, hopefully many of you are familiar at least with parts of it. You've probably heard of electrons before. Um, protons you may have heard of are, are made up of up quarks and down quarks. Um, and of course, there are other types of quarks and other types of leptons. So electrons have heavier um, versions of themselves, the muon and the tau, and also the neutrinos. Um, that correspond with each um, lepton type. Um, there are four fundamental forces in the um, well in the universe. Um, three of them are included here in the standard model. So the photon you've probably heard about is the mediator of the electromagnetic interaction. Um, the gluon is the mediator of the strong nuclear force, and then the W and Z bosons um, mediate the weak nuclear force. Um, the Higgs boson lies conveniently, conveniently in this diagram at the center of it all um, and is um, responsible for uh, imbuing other particles with their masses. So if we want to think about new physics scenarios that are heavy, we probably should think about the heaviest particle in the standard model. This is a good place to start at least, um, which would be the top quark. So if you arrange the standard model particles um, vertically in terms of their masses, you can see that they span quite a wide hierarchy um, of mass scales and the top quark is the particle that lies above all of the rest. So you should know some things about the top quark because we're going to be talking about them quite a lot today. The first is that the top is heavy. So the ratio of the top quark mass to the electron mass um, is something like 340,000, right? Depending on how many significant figures you want to keep. Um, the electron mass is about half an MeV. 
and the torque quark mass is much, much heavier than that, right? So it's 172.3 GeV. Um, this is roughly speaking equivalent to the ratio of the weight um, or the mass of uh, an Eastern cottontail rabbit to a blue whale. So if you had a fairly large blue whale and a fairly average sized rabbit, um, this is about the scale of the mass difference that we're talking about here. Um, as the top quark is heavy, it has the largest Yukawa coupling um, to the Higgs boson, right? So the Higgs is responsible for giving particles mass. Particles that couple strongly to the Higgs have a large mass. And the Yukawa coupling of the top is almost one. So it's much larger than the Yukawa couplings of other particles. This means that the top can play an important role in beyond the standard model physics scenarios. Um, which is why people were interested, particularly in looking for it, um, in, in looking for boosted top quarks in this context, right? And I know I haven't explained what a boosted top quark is yet, but please bear with us, and um, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, the top is unique among the quarks because it is actually so heavy that it can decay via the weak interaction, so uh, into a W and a B. And then a few different things can happen here because the top, if you look at the Feynman diagram in the center of the slide, um, decays to a W and a B, um, then the W can decay either to a lepton and a neutrino or to two quarks. So we can have either a leptonic top decay or a hadronic top decay, um, depending on whether or not everything are quarks or if there's a lepton in the mix. And this is true whether or not um, the tops are produced in the standard model, like in the sort of center Feynman diagram, or if they're produced by some BSM um, scenario, right? So the one on the right is a supersymmetric um, top partner that is produced and decays to a top quark um, and to another particle called a neutralino. So we observe particles at the LHC using particle detectors like the CMS detector, which is uh, depicted on this slide. Um, Detectors like CMS and ATLAS, which I'll show in the next slide, are general purpose um, detectors with this sort of cylindrical geometry that were installed at the LHC. They were designed um, to both discover the Higgs boson, um, should it exist, and also to be broadly sensitive to as many types of new physics signatures as could be managed in their design. Detectors like these consist of many different subsystems um, so we use different subsystems to look at different kinds of particles that are produced in LHC collisions so that we can reconstruct a picture accurately of what actually happened. So for instance, in the center of the detector is something called the silicon tracker system, which reconstructs the paths of charged particles bending in a magnetic field. So this is sort of first year physics um, ideas. You've probably been exposed to those before. Um, on the outside, we have a similar tracking uh, system, but this is um, designed to capture muons, which pass through most of the detector and leave tracks on the outside as well. And then there are calorimetry systems, which reconstruct the showers of electromagnetic um, particles like electrons and photons, and um, also hadronic particles, the so hadrons that are produced uh, in the collisions. Um, I'm showing this picture of Atlas as well, mostly for completeness. Um, today, the details of the detectors don't matter so much. So ATLAS and CMS um, differ in the nature of their subsystems. So what exactly technologies are used in them? But at the end of the day, their performance for taking boosted top quarks is roughly equivalent. Um, so both do a really, really excellent job. Um, and we'll be using an open data set um, produced by ATLAS, which actually consists of um, signal and background jets um, as they are reconstructed in Atlas, right? So it's as though we had Atlas data today. And this is a data set that's pr pr provided by Atlas um, for educational use um, in workshops like this one. So this is a picture of what happens when we collide protons at the LHC. Um, you can see a few, well, there are many different particles that are produced here. The yellow lines are the charge particles in the inner tracker that I mentioned before. They bend in the magnetic field so we can measure their momentum. The yellow, or sorry, the green and the blue blobs um, are energy depositions in the calorimetry systems in CMS. Um, so either in the electromagnetic or the hadronic calorimeters. Moving on to maybe a more interesting event, certainly something that's much rarer. Um, this is an event display that's consistent with a very rare type of Higgs decay, where you can see two muons. These are the red lines that come all the way outside of 
the, they pass through the inner detector and then are also reconstructed in the outer part of CMS. Um, and one photon, which is this green blob with the dashed line pointing to it in the calorimeter. Um, so you can see here another example of how as different particles leave um, different types of signatures in the detector, um, we can determine what they were and what happened in the event. This is an event display from Atlas, um, and you may not know it by looking at it, but I'm going to tell you that it's consistent with a top pair production. So this is the kind of top event that I was talking about before. But you may uh, not be able to find right away the signature of the quarks that are produced by the hadronically decaying top. And this is because instead of just leaving a simple signature in the detector, Quarks produce groups of particles called jets that are collimated. I can draw a line around them here uh, and sort of localized in the detector. And this is because of the nature of the strong interaction, which is the last thing that I want to talk about today. So by reconstructing these jets of particles, we can actually use the jet as a proxy for the quark or the gluon that initiated the jet. Um, and we can do things like measure its momentum or other properties um, in this way. So the strong interaction is something that you may not have encountered much. Um, it depends a bit on how far along in your studies you are. Um, but it has a few properties that are different than, for instance, gravity or the electromagnetic force, which are extremely important for what we'll be talking about today. And the first one is something called asymptotic freedom. So one of the sort of fascinating things about the strong interaction is that the strength of the interaction decreases as the energy scale increases. So what this means is that at low energy scales, sort of everyday energy scales, um, you don't see much except for color neutral bound states like a proton, for instance, um, which is a bound state of three quarks um, whose colors, which is a quantum number of the particles, add up to zero. And this has to be true for strongly interacting particles to sort of exist um, in this way. But if the energy scale is increased, the strength of the strong force decreases. Um, and this allows quarks and gluons to act freely for a time. Um, typically, they will start to radiate um, if they have a large momentum or energy. And this will end up reducing their energy scale. And so at the end of the day, what we always observe in the lab are these color neutral bound states. Um, even though by sort of turning up the energy, we can change the nature of the strong force for a, for a short time. So if we produce a quark or a gluon in an LHC collision um, with a high energy, then this strongly interacting particle will have a very high probability um, to radiate uh, gluon emission. So this is, uh, you know, if you have an, uh, an accelerating electron radiating, radiating photons, the same idea here, sort of with the strong force. Um, and it has a very high probability to radiate a gluon um, along its direction of travel, so at a small angle or collidier, um, or a very soft one. So the probability formula here is something relatively simple. Um, this alpha s is the strength of the strong force, and then you see one over the angle and one over the energy of the emission. So if either of these gets small, the probability gets very big and diverges um, for very collinear and very soft emissions. Um, by doing so, um, the strongly interacting particles um, produce something called a parton shower, um, and they lose their energy through this radiation. As the energy scale decreases, um, the strength of the strong force increases, and eventually it becomes energetically favorable for the sort of shower of particles that is produced to step into a set of color neutral bound states. So you can see an example of how this is happening um, in the Feynman diagram here that's inset, um, where strongly interacting particles are produced in the shower and then talk to each other via the strong force um, with these bars, which represent um, you know, them interacting, um, which eventually snap into sets of hadrons. Um, so this is a process called hadronization. It's not something that's understood um, in a perturbative way. Um, so it's basically something that we have to model empirically, and it's uh, 
a very active field of research or different models that sort of describe the dynamics of what's going on here. The upshot is that at the end of the day, um, instead of seeing just the quark or gluon, we see sets of many, many particles. So this can be sort of tens of particles at the LHC with energies that we reconstruct, um, which hit our detector, which is something that comes along with its own set of um, experimental sort of complications, um, which for the purposes of today, we're not going to worry about too much about. But if you get into this business um, as an experimental physicist, for instance, then you may start worrying about different sources of, uh, you know, effectively noise or bias that can enter your measurements when you're reconstructing hadronic jets. So it's possible that now you think jets are complicated, um, both experimentally and theoretically. I think this is true, but this is one of the reasons that they're a really good place to apply machine learning. So now I'm going to pass it on um, to Jennifer, who will tell us about jet substructure and um, a bit more about boosted tops. Great. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I'm going to share, let me find it. Ah, yeah. I'm going to share a screen that also has some of the CoLab um, workspaces because we will be using uh, some of these during the talk, uh, if I can find. Sorry. Um, I will start with the slides. So I'll tell you when it's uh, relevant to go um, to the, the CoLab account, but um, if you want to go ahead and pull up the basics uh, notebook, then you can go ahead and do that. We'll look at that first. Um, so yeah, so Matt already gave a nice introduction to why we are interested in TOPS, what JETS are, um, and a lot of different things. So I just want to build on that here and start talking about some of the ways we can think about um, how we can effectively tag a top uh, jet um, and um, how we can use machine learning to do that. So yeah, as Matt said, um, jets are composite objects. They're formed out of many constituents that are produced during the parton shower and hadronization process. Um, and so yeah, their inner structure that they have is closely tied to the parton shower. Um, and jet substructure is basically the field that looks at uh, the inside of a jet and tries to understand it and tries to apply it to um, identifying different types of jets um, and using them in different ways. Um, this is a relatively new area. Um, for a long time, it was thought that this couldn't be understood very well. We weren't really sure how much it could be used, um, but as it turns out, uh, it is now one of um, the, the pillars of how we do reconstruction um, in, in high energy uh, physics. Um, so it's a, a really important component for a lot of different types of physics. I mean, QCD, obviously, it has close connections too, um, but it's also used for things like Matt said, for, you know, for Higgs physics and for um, searches for physics beyond the standard model. So it has a lot of different applications, um, but it's also, as Matt said, very complicated. Um, so I don't have time to go into a really detailed look of um, everything about jet substructure, how we think about it, all of this. Um, there's a lot of resources for people who are uh, interested in this, but um, yeah, uh, certainly not enough time to go into this today. So I'm just going to try to give a bit of a whirlwind tour of things. Um, but yeah, what I first want to point out here um, is just an example of what a jet can look like. So this is an image of a jet um, in, an, in the angular space eta phi, which I will talk about in a minute. Um, and you can see each of these dots corresponds to one of the constituents in a jet. Um, with a color associated to how much uh, transverse momentum it has, so essentially how much energy is uh, in the particle. Uh, so you can see, first of all, that there are a lot of different particles in this jet, um, that they have maybe some kind of, you know, cluster structure you can see, but um, there's, uh, you know, it's certainly not something that the behavior is completely uh, well understood just by looking by eye. Um, so uh, we'll get to, I'll go back to the notebooks in a minute, but um, you'll be able to make some of these plots as well with the jets that we'll be looking at today. Um, so as Matt mentioned, um, a lot of the particles that we try to look for um, at hadron colliders and colliders in general um, aren't stable when um, we are trying to look for them. So for instance, um, top quarks, W bosons, these all decay before they reach the detector. Um, top quarks decay into a W boson and a B quark, um, and then the W boson can decay either to a lepton and a neutrino or into two quarks. 
Um, and the case we're interested in today is the case where, it, uh, where the W decays into two quarks, meaning that the top decays into three, um, three quarks, uh, two quarks of any flavor, and then a B quark. Um, so this is what we, I, I might refer to this as decaying hadronically because we end up with a bunch of hadrons at the end. Um, so each of these quarks will have an associated parton shower and hadronization process, um, just like for when we are just thinking about a quark or a gluon jet. So if you want to learn more about, you know, particle decays, interactions, et cetera, there's um, plenty of good introductions to particle physics, but yeah, not enough time to go into that right now. So um, the next thing I wanted to touch on is uh, the idea of a boosted object. So if we have, for instance, a W boson decaying into two quarks, if you are looking at the W boson, if it's at rest, or if you're looking at in its frame of reference, uh, the decay products are going to be back to back. Um, but if you imagine that you've now boosted this object, um, you've, it's now moving at a large momentum um, in some direction, like down here, um, then instead of being that back to back in the frame of view that you have, um, these two decay products are now going to be more collimated. Um, they'll be traveling roughly in the same direction as the uh, original W boson. So the higher the momentum, the more collimated these will become. Um, and so this is, yeah, what we call um, boosted objects. Um, and once these become collimated enough, then this means that we can reconstruct um, both of these, these quarks, both of its decay products into a single object, a single jet. Um, and so, yeah, this is, uh, this is where we, you know, have the field of jet substructure for tagging different types of jets, essentially. Um, so here I've just shown a W boson because it's simple, it decays into two objects, but there's a very similar story for a top uh, decaying into three objects, um, just a little messier to draw. So yeah, as I've, as I've kind of alluded to, um, different types of jets have different features, which are, which can be quite visible. So for instance, top jets tend to have three prongs, one for each decay product. Um, where each uh, quark will have an associated parton shower. So you can see an event display here um, from a uh, the production of top and anti-top. Um, so TT bar, I'll call it. Um, so you can see on one side of the detector um, a boosted top. So you can see the three prongs from the decay. Um, you can see these quite distinctly, and they all have you know some structure that you can see within them. Um, on the other side, you can see, you know, one jet, you can see a, a lepton, um, and then there's also nothing else, which is probably from the neutrino, um, which we don't detect in our, in, in, um, in CMS or Atlas. Um, on the, uh, over here, you can see an example of a cork or a gluon, uh, like, you know, cork cork um, process. Um, where we have two quark jets um, or two gluon jets. Uh, we don't know what type of flavor they are. Um, but you can see that they, these look very different from the top quark jets um, that we were looking at in the other event display. So these are more collimated. We don't see as much of a prongy structure. Um, there's still some structure going on within them, but it's, it's much less pronounced and much less uh, clear how this translates um, to some sort of uh, decay, since it's not coming from one. Um, so before diving into um, all of the observables that we're interested in, I thought it would be useful just to take a minute to talk about the coordinate system that we use uh, at Collider Experiments. Um, so jet algorithms typically cluster particles together that have very similar angles. Um, we use a cylindrical coordinate system where the angles are defined by um, pseudorapidity, which is very similar to the um, polar angle theta. Um, We'll kind of ignore the difference for now, but um, just to think about how, it, uh, just for how to think about it. Um, but it we use this because it's uh, Lorentz invariant, um, and then we use phi, which is the azimuthal angle, um, the kind of standard cylindrical coordinate. Um, and then for hadron colliders, we typically use the transverse momentum. So we have the the two particles colliding or the two protons colliding along the beam line. Um, and then the, the momentum in the transverse direction of this um, is what we uh, are interested in because this um, should sum to zero. The sum of all the um, transverse momenta should sum to zero for all of the particles produced in an interaction. 
Um, again, I'm not going into details about this, but you can kind of, if I say the PT of a, a particle or a jet, I'm talking about its transverse momentum, which you can roughly think about as its energy, though it's a, a bit more complicated than that. Good. So just a couple more event displays, because I think these are, are useful for trying to think about what type of substructure we're looking for. So W jets, as I mentioned, decay into two quarks. So you can see here a di boson event, possibly you know a WW event um, or something similar. Um, and you can see how there are, you know, for each of these jets, there are two distinct prongs of the jet that you can really see in this event display. Um, and so these are probably associated to each of the quarks from the decay. Similarly, you have the top um, TT bar process that I showed a couple slides ago, where you can see uh, the three prongs from the top quark decay. Good. So let's move on to jet tagging now that we've gotten through the basics of, you know, what are we even looking at in the first place? So the field of jet tagging is just trying to distinguish different types of jets from each other. So distinguishing, you know, top W, light quark, gluon, um, et cetera, all of these different types of jets, trying to find some metrics to uh, identify the different types. Um, and there are a lot of different features, some of which we will talk about today that can be used to characterize them. Um, and these involve using the constituents of the jet to make some sort of uh, definition of an observable that you can cut on. Um, this has been the subject of a, a lot of different uh, research over the years. So I've just made a very small sub, uh, sub um, small selection of papers that have been uh, written over the years on top tagging, but this is really quite a, um, an exciting field with a lot of people working on, on different ways of doing this. Um, many of these, most of these, um, in fact, using machine learning in some, in some form. Um, so yeah, I just wanna start with the basic ways that we can do this and build up to machine learning though. So kind of start from the beginning before we, we could use machine learning and uh, how, we, how we started to tag tops and go from there. Um, one, one more quick aside. Uh, so when we're talking about jet substructure, there are two main concepts we talk about. So there's jet grooming and jet um, substructure observable de definitions. Um, these feed into each other. So the grooming, it removes um, information that you don't care about very much um, to make certain features like the prongy structure more pronounced. Um, whereas the observables are just what observables, you know, how can we define something that makes sense to study these different types of jets? Um, so I, I will quickly talk about grooming since I think it's a useful thing to think about when we are talking about boosted objects. Um, but it's not super relevant to the rest of this um, this session, so I won't dwell on it too long. But I think it's it's useful for just keeping in mind the complexity of jets. So yeah, like I said, grooming algorithms remove some of the constituents of a jet to make their internal structure more more obvious. There are a lot of different types of grooming algorithms. I'm not going to go through most of these. The one I'm going to talk about today is jet trimming. Um, this is just one type that I think is relatively simple to explain. Um, so in the way that jet trimming works is you take, uh, you know, some sort, you have a, you start with a jet with a bunch of constituents in it, which you can see here. Um, this jet has some sort of radius R, and then you cluster, um, the constituents of this jet into jets that have a smaller radius. So you can see kind of a cartoon of what this looks like here, where you end up with multiple, you know, maybe order of eight or so subjets within this jet. Um, and then you look at the momenta of these subjects uh, compared to the momentum of the jet, and any of them that don't have very much momentum, you just throw away. Um, so all of these gray shaded ones are the ones that have a very small um, PT um, fraction of the jet, and they're just removed. Um, so you're left with something much simpler. So here you can see that you know, maybe you're trying to trim something that is a top cork jet, you're left with three prongs, which is what you would expect. You can see another cartoon of this year where you start, this is a slightly more realistic cartoon, um, but, you know, still obviously a bit, um, you know, it doesn't show all the complexity of things. But yeah, you can see the, the jet as it starts out, the clustering um, where you have the different colors associated to the different subjects that are produced. Um, and then what you have here is what's left after you apply the trimming algorithm. So you cut the constituents um, and then just these form a single jet now, which is why they're all the same color. Um, so again, you can see here that this removes, you know, if you look at this jet here, you might not see the clear three-pronged structure, whereas after you, after you apply this trimming, 
um, it's really made apparent that you have these three obvious um, prongs of it that are, that are relevant for your studies. Um, and yeah, this, this shows up in a lot of different ways. Um, this shows up in particular if you are looking at things like the jet mass, um, but in a lot of different observables as well. Um, I'll talk a bit more about the mass in a minute, um, but yeah, the um, you can see here in the solid lines, the solid black line is the um, mass of W jets if you don't apply any grooming algorithms, whereas in purple, if you apply the grooming algorithms, um, you get a much peakier structure and it has a mass that's much closer to the W mass of ADGEV. So you can imagine that this is quite useful both if you want to visualize your jets um, or make some sort of observable um, to look at them or to try to get properties that are closely associated to things like the W boson. So it's a very useful, um, uh, yeah, process. But the, the jets we'll be using today, these are groomed, but um, we won't talk more about the grooming algorithms here. So now I want to get into some of the observables that we talk about with jet substructure. Um, as you will see, this is in no way a comprehensive listing of all the observables we can use, um, but just to kind of give a sense of some of the ways we think about these jets and how we can feed information into a neural net um, to be used. So um, the first thing that we talk about when we talk about jet substructure is almost always the jet mass. Um, so this is um, you know, the invariant mass of all of the, um, the uh, constituents in a jet. Um, I think one thing that's worth pointing out here is, you know, if you, the invariant mass, the definition is given here. Um, these are momenta. I didn't put the arrow on them, but these are the three momenta, and this is the energy of the particles. Um, this has a simplification for energies much larger than the mass, um, which uh, the details of this are not so relevant, but I think the important thing to point out here so if you have two particles with an angle between them, these are going to have some non-zero mass. Um, if you have a decay, like a W decaying into two quarks, um, this is not going to change the invariant mass. But for instance, if you have a quark that um, emits a gluon during the parton shower, uh, like Matt was talking about earlier, um, these will make a uh, produce a mass um, for this system. So even though a quark and a gluon um, they're essentially massless or close to massless in the case of cork. Um, the jets that you have uh, can have fairly large masses because they are um, they have this parton shower. Um, and the larger the angle or the higher the momentum of the emission, this will make a larger mass. So you can see an example here of what the mass distribution looks like for W jets as compared to multi jets, which is what we call cork and gluon jets. Or QG jets, depending on how we write it. Um, you can see here that the W jets um, have a nice peak. It's a little bit lower than the W mass, um, probably due to some effects from the grooming, but you know it's quite close. It's quite peaky. There's some spread, which is um, due to things like the parton shower. But you know you can imagine that this looks quite uh, quite cleanly, you know, like a W mass distribution should. Um, and then the multi-jets in general have a much lower mass. They peak um, at much lower values. Um, the, the explanation for why they have this shape is quite complicated. Um, it's something that's uh, you know, being studied by um, theorists, but um, certainly too in-depth to go into today. So yeah. Um, yeah, the jet mass is one of the obvious observables, and yeah, it's a good way of distinguishing between different types of jets, since you will have, you know, peaks um, in very different places, depending on the type of jet you're looking at. Um, so yeah, we'll come back to this, but yeah, the notebook has, um, a, you know, a comparison of the different mass distributions for the top jets that we have in the, the sample, as well as the, um, the, the cork and gluon jets. So the next observable I want to just briefly talk about is what's called the n subjettiness. So this is one of the observables that was used for many years to uh, distinguish between um, top jets and uh, cork and gluon jets. Um, so uh, yeah, this is one of the most powerful ways of looking at, um, at at these jets, and it essentially tries to answer, you know, does this jet have n prongs, um, where n is the n in n subjettiness? The formula you can see here. Um, the 
delta r1 um, etc these are all the different prongs in your jet um, i'm not going to go through how you define the different prongs in your jet just take it take me at my word that there is a way of defining this um, you can read more about this um, if you're interested um, but basically, yeah, it sums over all the constituents K in your jet um, and sees how far each constituent is from each of the different prongs um, and finds the minimum one. So if they're all of the if all of your constituents are really closely aligned to any single prong um, or like any one of the prongs, um, then this is going to have a very small value. Whereas, you know, if you have um, them kind of spread out more evenly, you know, they might have a large angular separation, uh, making this have a larger value. Um, so you can see, yeah, we typically, yeah, we typically use actually ratios of n subjettiness. Um, again, you can read this paper for more details on why this is, um, but yeah, the this tends to produce better separation. Um, yeah. So you can see here um, one of the observables that we use, which is the ratio of tau 3 over tau 2, um, which is what I'll often refer to as tau 3, 2. Um, this is one of the observables that was used for a very long time for top tagging. Um, so you can see here um, the difference between top jets and QCD jets, and that these look quite different. Um, the features are quite distinct. So you can imagine that making a cut on this would be quite useful if you're trying to identify top quarks. Um, and then the last observable I wanted to talk about before we move to the notebook um, is um, energy correlation functions. So energy correlation functions are products of energies and angles um, of the jet constituents. And this is something that is frequently used in taggers. The formula is here. Um, this looks quite complicated. So let's just consider the case of beta equals two. Um, this is the energy correlation function two, which you can see here. Um, this is much simpler. It just sums over the uh, constituents of the jet, multiplying um, the products of their transverse momentum and their angular separation. So if you have really large constituent um, PT or very large angles between jets, um, this will become larger. So if you have a one-pronged jet, this will tend to have smaller values because it won't have as large of angular separation, while two-pronged jets will have larger values. Um, again, we often use ratios um, of the ECFs because this improves the performance. Um, yeah, but, you know, uh, the definitions of these ratios are quite complicated. I don't want to get into them, but um, you can see here a, a, one of these ratios being used to distinguish um, Z jets from QCD jets. Okay, and then the final thing I wanted to mention before we look at the first notebook um, is um taggers so we've talked a lot about different observables um probably some of you are familiar with what it means to tag a thing and uh with rock curves but i thought it would be useful just to spend a minute on this before before um diving in just so we're all on the same page so if you want to tag a jet or tag anything you place some cut on observable and you say that on one side of this cut this is your signal and the other side is what you throw away as background so obviously you're going to keep some of your background um, in the signal selection because it's not going to be a perfect tagger. Um, and you know how good this is, you know how much your uh, the comparison of your signal efficiency and your background efficiency is what you care about. Um, so if you scan over a, a range of cuts, um, you can actually produce the background efficiency as a function of the single signal efficiency um, to see you know if you cut away, for instance, fifty percent of your um, signal, you know, you keep only maybe 20% of your background, um, which is quite good. You're getting rid of a lot of the background that you don't want to be looking at. Um, so yeah, these curves, um, which parameterize the background efficiency as a function of the signal efficiency are often what we refer to as rock curves or receiver operator characteristic curves. Um, one thing I'll note is uh, be careful reading these plots. Um, depending on what people are using for the y-axis, they can look quite different. So for instance, some people will use just the straight background efficiency. Um, oftentimes what you'll see is one over the background efficiency. So depending on you know what you're using, the better version might point, you know, the uh, improvement might be signaled by moving in a different direction. So I'll try to indicate this on the plots. I might have missed a few places, but just something to keep an eye out for since um, 
people have different conventions and yeah there's a couple other ones that aren't mentioned here um and I, I think one other thing that we will see in the the slide in the notebooks is that sometimes you know here we see that you know one of these is always the blue line um, is always better than the red line um, but sometimes these can cross so depending on what application you have how much um, signal efficiency you want to have one tagger might be better than the other so yeah, I think with that, um, before we move on to the neural network um, stuff, I think it might be useful to go through um, the first notebook just briefly. Um, and I think some of this you can play around with um, with later, but I think it will help make sure you have all the tools to look at you know, different observables and understand top jets just a little bit better. And I think once we go through this, we'll probably take a short break um, before moving on to the neural networks. Um, so yeah, this is just the, the zero one notebook. It's called the basics. Um, so we'll just kind of click through the first things which are used to set up, um, you know, install a few necessary things and um, get our um, imports correct. Um, so we're downloading here the file that Matt mentioned, which is this um, open data from Atlas. Um, it's actually our simulation, um, but, um, and this is a really nice, um, set uh, data set because it has you know a lot of um, jets for us to use we're using just a small subset actually here um, to uh, make sure that things can we can train the networks quickly enough but um, so um, I'm hoping people are clicking along I'm trying not to you know there's nothing too exciting going on yet but um, you know mention in the chat or Q&A or something if you're having if if there's a problem um, so here, I think, you know, we can read the, the data set that we've downloaded. Um, and the one thing I want to point out here is that you can see the list of observables in our, our data set. So a lot of these you might not be familiar with. Um, D2, you might have uh, heard me mention a couple slides ago. Um, these ECFs are energy correlation functions. Um, tau1 is um, the n subjettiness, um, et cetera. So you can see the list of observables that we have available to us. So anything not in here is not something you can use. It doesn't mean it's not useful, but just uh, not available in this data set. Um, so yeah, like I promised, um, so we can make um, jet images similar to what I was showing at the beginning of the talk. So I have a couple examples here, just of um, a cork and a gluon jet first, where you can see that everything is kind of clumped together in you know something that doesn't have much obvious structure. Um, compared to um, here, what we have is a top cork jet, um, where you can see much more clearly the three-pronged structure that we are looking for. So um, here you can choose different jet indices. So these are just the indices of whatever jet in the data set that we have. Um, I think we have a million jets or something like this. So you're not going to look through all of them, but you can um, try different ones. Um, and it will also print out the label for if the um, if this is a top cork or not. So if it's one, which this one is, um, this is a top cork. Um, and you can see here again, the obvious three prong structure. Um, as you're going, if you try different um, versions of this, you'll probably find that some of the top corks look a lot more top like than others. Some of them will not always have this structure as clearly as others. Um, so I think that's useful to, to keep in mind um, that, you know, this is a hard problem. Sometimes it's very easy to do by eye, but in reality, things can get a little bit messier. We've chosen this one because it looks quite nice. It's, you can really see the, the features obviously, but, you know, the interesting part of this comes into play when we're trying to distinguish things that are a little bit less obviously a top cork. So moving on from there, we can you know, make some plots um, of some of the different substructure observables I was talking about. So we'll start with the jet mass. Um, so this is F jet M, so that's the mass. Um, here, we're just doing a conversion of the units um, into GeV, which is one of the units we frequently use in particle physics. Um, we set the range. Um, and this is all of the jets uh, in the in, in the data set. Um, so you'll see that there's you know this is both including the signal um, top jets and then the background cork and gluon jets. So it's it's not so useful to have them together, um, but 
you know, you can see kind of a peak around the top quark mass of 170 GeV, which is a good sign that, you know, this is something we will be able to see. So if we want to just look at the um, top quarks, then we can make a mask that um, looks at the label of a jet, which tells us if it's a top or not um, in this data set. So if it's a top, then we can plot it. Um, we apply this mass just to the same array that we had before. And here you see very clearly a distribution that looks quite peaky around where the top mass is. So around 170-ish GEV. Um, similarly for the background quark and gluon jets, um, you can see this here. So this, um, in this case, you have a much more smoothly falling spectrum, which is what we saw in the slides before. So um, again, no big surprises here, but just kind of showing you that you can see all of these features that I was talking about in, in the data set that we have, um, and you can play around with it. Um, you should get stuff that looks quite similar to what we were seeing in the slides. Um, of course, you can plot things on top of each other. Um, this can be very useful for telling you, you know, how well can you distinguish between two things. So you could imagine that if you place a cut somewhere here, you know, you might be able to identify top quark jets and distinguish them from signal jets. Like if you say the mass has to be above, you know, 150 GV, you're throwing away a lot of your background jets. Um, yeah, again, we have tau 3 2. You can look at the signal and the background distributions for these, much like I had um, in the slides. Um, you'll find that the distributions here look slightly different than what I had in the slides. Um, because those were not from the same data set, so they have a slightly different selection. Um, so the, the shapes might look a little bit different, but um, that's okay. But you see the same relevant features, which is that the top jets have a lower um, tau 3 2 than the um, quark and gluon jets. Um, and then, yeah, you can see, you know, some of the other observables, so ratios of energy correlation functions. So for instance, the D2 that we saw in the slides, was used for tagging Z quarks or Z jets um, rather, um, which have a two prong structure similar to what the W does. Um, so if you look at this for top quarks, which have three prongs, you'll notice that while the shapes are different for your top and your background jets, they aren't so different. So this is not really a great observable to be using to tag your jets. Um, so this isn't necessarily surprising. This observable is made two prong, uh, to tag two prong structure. Um, but it, yeah, it's, um, I think good to have a comparison for something that doesn't work here. Um, so yeah, next, I, I think the last thing we really need to go through in this notebook is making some rock curves. So these are like what I was showing you in the slides. Um, we're using here, um, here we're just using the signal efficiency. I think later we'll use one over the signal efficiency, but okay. Um, so yeah, you want things to be the further down and to the right that they are, the better the tiger they are. So you can see the mass tau three, two and D two here. And these are all, you know, one tigers that cut on one observable. Um, they're not very complicated, but you can see that there is a pretty big range of the performance here. So D two, um, as we kind of expected by looking at the plots, it doesn't have a very good tagging behavior overall. Um, it's generally pretty bad at identifying your, your signal, um, which isn't very surprising. The mass, it doesn't do super well for a while, but as you get to more and more pure samples, um, it does a pretty good job of um, removing your background. Um, and then tau 3 2 does a great job just across the board. Um, at very high purities, it does a little bit worse, but... Um, yeah, it's it's a there's a reason that this was used frequently um, in in the different uh, in taggers by by the different experiments for a long time. Um, so I think with that um, we'll take a short break um, and then I'll briefly go through um, uh, deep neural networks um, and then I'll pass things off to Lucas. So um, yeah, I'll stop sharing for now. Yeah, I think. Is the plan to take a five minute break? Is that correct? Absolutely, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Really, really appreciate your uh, um, instruction. Thank you so much. Uh, so we can take questions uh, if people would like to. Um, 
I don't see any yet in the um, uh, in the Q and A system or the uh, chat system. But please, if you'd like to, otherwise, as Jennifer was suggesting, uh, we should take a brief. Um, let's. I guess we. I yeah. I guess we'll call it the top of the hour. <laughs> I, I realize that's only two or three minutes, but we we can um, we we can delay a little bit past that just if people need a break, a bathroom break or whatever, a restroom break. Um, but please also take advantage right now uh, if you would like to ask any questions before we pick up on the uh, you know, the modular, the workshop um, um, uh, uh, notebook uh, aspect. And then, as mentioned before, we are trying to help people via the Slack system that's uh, linked on the, uh, you know, on the on the workshop front page. If if you do have um, uh, you know any administrative or um, technical issues outside of detailed machine learning which are be much better to ask jennifer <laughs> um uh, you know and obviously the you know the workshop uh, in the middle of the workshop because i think you'll help not only yourself but uh, other 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 people anyway we'll we'll we're on break right now but do if anybody wants to ask questions use the uh, use the uh, chat or the q a so should i go ahead and get started yes marvelous thank you great um, I'll also say, yeah, for while we're doing the, the hands-on section, um, there will certainly be some time for Q and A. So please, you know, think about any questions you have about either neural nets or tagging or jets or anything like this, um, because there'll be a bit of time while we're waiting for things to train. Um, so before we're talking about neural nets, I think, you know, we can just quickly talk about, you know, the previous slides we were talking about just a one-dimensional tagger we have one observable we make a cut on it um and then we make some sort of tagger from this um if you combine cuts on different observables this can result in a much more powerful tagger because you can imagine that um the different uh observables have different information about a jet and so you know by making different cuts on them then this can make something more powerful so for instance, here, uh, what you have is a rock curve for um, in the, the left side for just a mass only cut. Um, and you can see this compared to the rock curve for a mass um, plus D2 cut. And this is for W jets, which have two prongs. So the D2 is a, a useful observable. Um, and you can see that for instance, at a 50% tagging efficiency, um, the uh, background rejection is significantly higher for the two variable tagger than it is for just tagging on the mass itself. So some of this is coming from using the D2, which is a useful observable, but some of this is also coming from the fact that having these two uh, dimensions that you're cutting in is um, much more um, much more powerful than just using one on its own. Um, one of the reasons this is possible to do in a pretty straightforward way is because D2 and the mass are fairly uncorrelated. So you can kind of choose a cut on each of these separately, um, and it's not going to be completely unreasonable for the final um, the final result that you're trying to, for the final tagger that you want to have. Um, but I think one of the things that's important to note is that, you know, in, in reality, there are a huge range of observables that we have. So I've shown just a few classes of observables here, you know, with the n sub jettiness and ECFs, you know, these have, I, I showed examples of tau 3, 2, but there, are, you know, you can choose any value of n, you can take any number of the ratios. Uh, and similarly with the energy correlation functions. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot more information that we could use um, in these taggers. Um, and not all of this information is going to be uncorrelated. So a lot of these are going to have very complex um, correlations between them, which is going to make it very difficult to design the tagger that works well um, in a very meaningful way um, when you're using it in these high dimensions. Um, and that's exactly where neural nets are useful, is you know when you have a lot of different observables that are potentially correlated, um, it can you know take into account these correlations. Um, and you know, use a lot of high dimensional inputs um, in order to get you some sort of output that is useful. So the first type of neural networks we're gonna talk about today are deep neural networks. So for these, um, the types that we're talking about here or that we'll show in the notebook, um, these are uh, yeah, deep neural networks, which means they have these multiple hidden uh, layers. 
Um, in the case of uh, these networks, they will be fully connected. So all of the nodes um, in each layer will be connected to all of the nodes. Um, and the next one, um, and yeah, for this, you have the input layer, which is just whatever observables you want to throw at your network, basically. So for instance, you have the jet mass, tau 3 2 your ECFs. Um, there are a lot of different, you know, you can choose any number of input layers here. It's just three, but obviously um, more can be useful. Um, and then you have a final output layer, um, which uh, is basically, you know, some sort of observable. In this case, if it's just one node, which you can see we have here, um, this is just a one-dimensional observable that you can make a cut on, which is just like you can do with a tiger. Um, so yeah, this is cases like this where you have a lot of correlated high-dimensional information is exactly where a neural network can be uh, very useful. Um, and yeah, you can just cut on the output layer in the same way as you would cut on any of the other observables that we were using to make rock curves before. Um, yeah, and so you can see an example of how much this can improve your performance um, when uh, comparing to just uh, kind of a, a two-dimensional variable that we have used before. So for instance, we have these two types of neural networks. We have the DNN, which is what we're looking at here uh, in today's uh, hands-on session. There's also a boosted decision tree. Um, these are not used quite as much these days, so I'm not going to go into details about it, but um, there's more information in the, the paper there for anyone who's interested. Um, but yeah, you can see here a, a two variable tiger. Um, these are top jets, um, you can see. So this is using tau32 and the jet mass to define some sort of tiger. Um, and if you instead have a neural network, which has, I think, order of 10 or 15 inputs to it, um, this has much better background rejection than the simple two variable tiger. Um, because it has so much more information, because it has all these different observables and their correlations, which means it's able to take into account all of this um, and make a much more powerful tiger. Um, yeah, so the the example that I show here, it's using a slightly different data set than what we have in the notebook, but it's a very similar concept. Um, in the notebook, what we have are 15 observables. You can see a list of them here. Um, I thought I, I, oh yeah, the, there's a link here um, for more information about all the observables and the, uh, the different neural networks, um, uh, all of the ones that we're using, to, or pretty much all the ones we're using today, actually. Um, but yeah, you can see some familiar things such as the energy correlation functions, and their ratios. You can see some ends of jettinesses um, here. There's some other ones which I didn't have time to get into, um, but you know, there's a lot, a wide range of observables that go into this. And yeah, like I said, it's a dense neural network. In the case of the notebook, we'll have five fully connected hidden layers instead of the two that I was showing on the previous slide. And each of these will have 180 nodes um, with an activation function. And yeah, the final layer will be one output node um, with a sigmoid activation. Um, yeah, and then the to get the loss for this, we're using binary cross entropy. Um, so this is something that's very commonly used for classification. If you're trying to do some sort of regression, for instance, you will use a different type of loss. Um, but this is one of the most commonly used things to for classification problems. So yeah, just before we go to the hands-on section where we'll actually get to try training um, one of these and you can play around a bit with the features. Um, yeah, I think it's just useful to have a few takeaways. So yeah, neural networks are super useful if we want to include correlations between different observables. So this is this provides huge potential gains over a simple optimization of a cut in n dimensions. And it's also much easier. You don't have to you know, try to think about by eye what you should be doing. You can just um, put it into a neural network which can handle it appropriately. Um, the tigers that we're using here, um, or the neural network that we're using here, it still relies on defining some sort of observables that you use as inputs to the DNN. So for instance, the mass or the tau 3, 2. So you can imagine that this is you know, maybe a bit suboptimal, um, which will be the topic of the, the next um, uh, discussion by Lucas. Um, because you're still processing all the information of the constituents into some sort of form. There are benefits to this. It's in some ways more legible. You can understand what these mean, but it also means that you might be losing information because you have to decide on some set of observables in advance um, that might not be fully optimal. So 
Um, with that, I think we can go ahead and move to the training. Um, so this will be uh, part two. So this is the, the training notebook. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll we'll start. Um, I think the first thing to all for everyone to check. Oh, yeah. So I have too many sessions. I'll get rid of my other one, which I don't need anymore. Um, yeah, the first thing to check is just you know what type of uh, tag are we using. So for this, I everyone should be using the HLDNN, the high level DNN. So it's using these high level observables or these observables that we're kind of pre-processing out of the constituents themselves. Um, we'll talk about these other ones later, um, but I think it would be useful for everyone to be on the same page to start. But if you want to train the other ones, yeah, you'll come back and run a second time. So we'll go through this. Um, so the first parts, again, are quite boring. We're in importing things and um, downloading things, so not so exciting. Um, this is, ah, yeah. But... Um, Yeah. So, um, yeah, some of these are, are things that are important for some of the other networks that will be training, but this way they'll all be installed. Um, let's see, it's almost done. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, like it says in the instructions, there's some problems with the dependencies. So we just have to rerun this again, um, and then it should be just fine. Um, but this is expected, so don't don't panic if it if, if it's red. Um, yeah. So yeah, this is if anyone has any questions, um, they don't have to be super excited. Oh, you know, they they can be tangentially related or more in depth um, as you wish. But this is a good time to start thinking of them. So we'll keep going through, clicking through these, just downloading the data sets. Um, can take a minute since it's fairly large. Um, and then this is just pre-processing some of the information. Um, yeah. So this next part, yeah, this um, has part of the information we'll need uh, for the training. So it tells us how many jets we're training on. We have a million jets um, in the um, in the sample. Um, and um, yeah, this is how many we're using. Um, some of these will be used to validate um, the, the training instead of used directly for the training itself. Um, there's a few things about the training that I didn't get into, the number of epochs and um, the batch size. Uh, this will basically determine how many times it will run over the training. Um, so if you have too few of these, then it's not going to end up with the best result. Um, if you have too many of these, it will take a very long time to train. Um, and the batch size is just one of the hyperparameters um, that determines how things are kind of grouped when it's doing the training. So now the more interesting stuff. So you'll see here that the tagger type is HLDNN, which we talked about before. So this has the list of all the observables that are used in the training, like I mentioned. So this has, yeah, the, um, all these 15 observables, um, some of which you're now familiar with, some of which you're not. Um, but this is just the list. Um, and I, I encourage you guys later, um, if you have time, to try this with different sets, subsets of these um, to see how this impacts the performance. Um, see if there are any of these that are really doing most of the work or if really it's uh, relying more on the, the um, correlations between the observables. Um, yeah, and then we're just uh, making the training and testing data. We separate the training and testing into two different portions um, so that we can um, not just validate everything using the, the data that we were training with. So the next bit is the, the hyperparameters or the information about the network that we're using itself. Um, so uh, we're not using an EFN, so we can ignore this. We keep going down. So here we have the tagger type is HLDNN, which is what we are using here. Um, 
So some of this is stuff that is basically, you can just transfer this to, you know, any other neural network that you want to train. If you have a different data set with different inputs, you can basically transport all of this. You know, you uh, have to make the data set into the similar format of the trained data, but um, then you can basically plug it in and go if you want. Um, for here, like I said, we have five hidden layers, um, which, uh, each with 180 nodes um, with the ReLU activation. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, if you have time later to play around with this, see, you know, I, I sometimes when I have a new tool that I'm trying, I like to break it. So I like to maybe make these both quite small and see if the neural network behaves, um, if it does as well, because the smaller you make it, the less um, flexibility the network has. Um, and uh, so it's not going to be able to train as well. Um, so then we can go ahead and start with the training. So this will take some time. So yeah, you see the number of the um, epoch that it is running on um, out of 20. So each of these will take you know around 10 or 15 seconds to, to run. So we have a bit of time here um, while these are going. Um, I don't see any questions, so if I can keep talking maybe a bit about um, the network and what is configured here. Um, but if people have questions, please, please interrupt. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned before, yeah, we have, we've split the set, um, uh, the training set into the training and the validation samples, which makes sure that we, when we validate things that we um, are using a uh, different set of non-overlapping events or jets, um, which is important because if you are training your neural network and you're just training it uh, all on once, uh, on one set of uh, events, um, then it can start to think that this, um, whatever set data set, set it has is uh, perfect and it might get into some weird corner of phase space. It might think that some sort of cut is really great um, whereas if you look at a wider set of events, then it's um, maybe just overtrained. Um, so yeah, you can see that the the network is evaluating the the um, the validation loss as well as the the loss, which is the loss on the the training um, data set. So validation loss is actually what it uh, you really should be caring about more here because this is the you know orthogonal set of jets. Um, used in the training. Um, so yeah, the loss is basically some sort of metric. You, you've probably heard about this by now if uh, since this is day two of the workshop. Um, but the loss is you know a way of evaluating you know how good is this network. So it, usually we try to minimize the loss. So you can see that uh, with each um, epoch, um, you have a smaller and smaller value of of this, um, though you know the change can be quite small. Um, yeah, so it's depending on what sort of problem you're trying to solve, um, for, you might use a different loss function because this, cal uh, this captures what sort of information is relevant, what sort of flexibility you care about, which, you know, do you care about thing like with regression problems, you might say that, you know, if things are really, really far away from what you expect them to be at, maybe you should ignore these because there's maybe some problem with these to, to begin with, for instance. Um, so there are a lot of different loss functions that are out there, um, which uh, are probably worth looking into um, depending on the type of problem you're solving. But as I mentioned, yeah, here we're just using um, the binary cross entropy, which is very common for classification problems. So if you're doing a classification, I would say you can probably just start with this um, and go from there. But um, can be it can be worth looking into different options for this as well. Um, so we're about halfway done with this, I would say. Um, let's see if there's anything else that would be worth mentioning here. Um, we can just wait for this to finish. Still don't see, I'll check the Slack as well.
yeah, Lucas or Matt, if either of you have anything you think could be worth mentioning here, feel free to go ahead. No, I think uh, I'm very happy that you are setting very well the ground and the explanation, so I don't have to spend much time <laughs> on many things. Yeah, you're making our job very easy, which is good. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess everyone is a, a bit quiet today. Um, but please, you know, you can also ask us questions about particle physics in general, if there are things that you're curious about. We got oh, one in the chat. Question. Yeah. yeah. So are there any rules to help determine the number of layers and the number of nodes in each layer for the deep network for this problem? So that's a very complicated question. So there's there's no hard and fast rules for this. Um, to some degree, uh, the more the more nodes um, and layers you have, the more flexibility your network has. Um, and this can be good in, in many ways. It can um, make it easier for you to capture more complex correlation information, for instance. Um, the more nodes and layers you have, um, the longer it will take to train as well. Um, and it can also lead to, you know, maybe a bit uh, of overtraining in some cases as well. So there's some balance usually in, you don't want too many nodes um, and layers, but if you give it too few, then you will start to have a worse, um, worse loss. So usually there's some sort of hyperparameter scan, you scan over the things like your your number of nodes, your number of layers, your learning rate, which I haven't touched on yet, but things like this, you will scan over often when you are training a neural net. Um, and it's, you know, as you, as you do it more, you might kind of figure out what tends to work for the size of the data set you have. And, you know, if you have not that many events, then you aren't going to be, there's just inherently less flexibility in those, uh, the correlations in those events anyhow. Um, if you have fewer inputs, there's going to be less information it needs to capture, for instance. Um, but it's it's certainly tricky. It's certainly an area of study. Hyper, hyperparameter scans are something that, um, you know, people talk about how you should do this. There's tools for this, et cetera. Okay, so. Um, what we can can see I add here? one more comment on this? Oh, so please, it, yeah, go ahead, Lucas. It's tricky. You know, one thing that uh, if you go very deep, like 15, 20 layers, you, have, you may encounter the problem of vanishing gradients. And then there are tricks like uh, skip connection, residual connection. So they learn some techniques to, to, to train very deep neural networks. Because, you know, as Jennifer said, you know, you go deeper, they learn very well. And then, you know, there is very little room to learn, so it may end up being in a local minimum and uh, and just the training doesn't improve. So if you look in the literature, it's called like residual connections or skip connections. So you skip layers that it doesn't learn much and you go to the next the deeper one or two deeper ones. Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing I'll also mention here, I got rid of this clear figure here um, so I could see the loss uh, at the end. Um, and you can see that this is starting to overtrain here. So here um, you can see that the training, the loss gets keeps getting smaller and smaller for the, the training, but it gets, uh, well, I guess it's maybe not overtraining yet, but it, there is some difference here, which, and the loss is better for the training than for the validation. Um, the validation loss is still decreasing. Um, so this is, this is good, but you can see that there, you know, if you kept training, maybe this would, not it would start to find some sort of phase space uh, where you know this validation set is it's not going to be performing optimally for it anymore so um it's not overtrained yet but it uh you know there's clear differences between these two sets which in principle shouldn't have any real differences between them they're just a random selection the validation only has 20 percent of the events in it but um yeah you might want to comment that out if you want to, to look at this um, and then I'll make sure I add this here. So yeah, then the next thing that we want to do, so we can make a couple plots here that we're not going to talk about in great detail, um, but that basically look at the, the performance, um, of the tiger. Um, but the main thing that we need to run here is, um, running the predictions. So basically applying, um, the, the the neural net to the test data set. Um, and then we will uh, uh, then write this out. So yeah, this makes a plot of the background rejection as a function of the JET PT. Um, 
for a given signal efficiency. So 50% and 80% signal efficiency. So you can see that, for instance, at 50% signal efficiency, yeah, this um, background rejection is not so different. Um, but the main thing that we want to do here is um, then we will connect to our Google Drive. Um, and this will save a file to your account. Um, so if you want to look at it, you can just go to your Google Drive. It'll show up there. Um, and this means that we will be able to compare all of the different predictions later. Um, the other thing I'll mention, so yeah, we, I just have it print the tag or type at the end here. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention here is that um, if anyone, uh, as you've seen, it can take a little while to train the data uh, or train the, the tigers. Um, so we have also provided example um, uh, examples of the pre-trained files that you need. So if you if you want to just copy these into your main directory, then um, you know we encourage you guys to play around with the different hyperparameters and the different uh, sets and features of these. But if you want to make the plots later, um, then uh, you should feel free to go ahead and do that um, to copy them if you don't have time to train them all. So I think with that, um, I will go ahead and hand this back to Lucas. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and also Matt. Uh, let me share my slides. Okay, you can see them, I guess. And let me make it also full screen. Okay. So, yeah. So now in this third part of uh, of this, uh, yeah, of, of this module, actually, we are going to discuss uh, about where we stand now, what are the state of the art tools that we have in, in top and jet identification in general. So as discussed by Jennifer, uh, a decade ago or so, we were using algorithms based on high level variables as in input to simple uh, deep learning algorithms. And as you see, for instance, in a rock curve here that uh, Jennifer explained what are the different axes, Effectively, each line is a different algorithm. So as you understand, it's a very hot topic in both the theory and experiment communities. The beginning, it was not clear what are the correlations between the different observables that we used uh, as input to this algorithm. And uh, for instance, can you estimate them uh, uh, individually or these uh, different patterns, patterns that we are trying to exploit can be uh, should be estimated simultaneously. The tagging is a complicated uh, problem. This is a top quark decaying to a B and a W boson, and then the W goes to two quarks. I know this because we use simulations, so I can cheat and see which is the B and which is the W. But you see, it's quite complicated. You cannot even distinguish the two, uh, the two prong structure from the W decaying to two quarks. So the question is, with this approach, are we exploring the full potential of our event reconstruction and our detectors? So in order to improve the jet tagging algorithm, what we need? We need more complex, more powerful architectures. But this is part of the gain that we can achieve. The other one is to use um, the as natural as possible representation of the jet, because this will improve the performance. It will make the learning more uh, efficient, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So let's take a step back. So the event or the particle reconstruction is a, follows a multi-stage approach. So first we start with detector signals. The different colors are signals in different uh, the subsystems of the main detector. Then we go into each uh, detector and we group, we cluster signals that are um, we believe they are coming from the same source. And then we combine information from the different detectors to provide a list of particles, right? For instance, if we want to identify an electron, we combine information for the electromagnetic calorimeter and the tracking system. And then, as we were doing, like, up to, let's say, almost 10 years ago, we use this information to build more complicated objects like the jets and then uh, de uh, define observables that are um, relevant to identify specific uh, features inside the jet. Okay, and then use them as input an algorithm to, uh, to 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 identify the flavor of the jet. Now, 
a recent development, like recently in terms of like the last four or five years, we started doing this. We said, okay, let's say like instead of using, let's keep this step and use directly lower level information, directly the particles. And this will have an advantage of exploiting the full granularity of our detector, right? So we use this green, the particles here to reconstruct, to represent it. So, and why this is uh, this could be it could be very powerful because each of these particles that we see here it comes with a very rich set of information, different uh, properties that I'm in the interest of time I'm not going to discuss them here. But long story short, we're talking about order of forty to fifty properties for each particle, and depending on the jet type, we can have something like fifty to hundred particles. So we're talking order of thousand inputs per jet. So it's a big number, this, and this is an ideal case for deep learning based algorithms with low level information as in. And when I say low level information, I mean particles directly, the jet constituents directly without uh, creating high level observables. Now, and this was actually, the, we started working on particle based the tagging algorithms and a very important, as I said earlier, uh, component is how to represent the jet. So I'm going to give you a very brief tour de force to understand how we build on prior knowledge and how we reach the state of the art techniques that we use now that is based on graph neural networks. So you've seen a similar approach from Jennifer. So the first approach was to treat the detector as a camera and the jet as an image, right? The intensity of each pixel here is uh, usually either the average or the sum of the contributions from different uh, particles in this uh, uh, pixel, and then apply techniques that are used for uh, image uh, recognition, like you want to separate a cat and a dog. And very powerful, these uh, techniques to extract features from an image, like the ears or the tail or the face, are uh, convolution operations. So we define different convolution filters Right, different colors correspond to different filters that are uh, aiming to capture different, uh, to identify different features. We slide the filters across the image and uh, we have a set of maps, a, a set of other images that are, uh, uh, you know, they are sensitive to specific features, right? So, and then we, we, we stack many convolutional layers to explore more and more uh, uh, details. Some techniques that uh, also improve the robustness and the, you know, and also uh, are able to promote specific features is called pooling. Effectively, we define uh, another window here, a fixed window in these uh, maps, and we apply some operations like either pick the maximum value or the average or the minimum, depending on what we want to achieve. So we extract the features, and the last step is to do the classification, usually using uh, dense networks, fully connected networks that Jennifer uh, described earlier. So we want to exploit the correlations between uh, the different uh, images, the different uh, pixels in the images. And the output could be a binary uh, classifier, so separated top quark from uh, quarks or gluon, or it can be multi-class, separated top W, etc. And this actually brought a very important improvement in performance. This again, we compare in terms of rock curves. So the, the, the lines that are contained in this blue box use are, based, are algorithms using high level information. The red ones are different flavors of uh, this uh, jet image based approach. Long story short, you see improvement can achieve improvements of a factor of two of in background rejection for the same top tagging efficiency. So this is a very important improvement, but still there are some uh, things that we could improve, right? First of all, if you look at this plot on the left, most of it is white. So we use, means that there are no particles there. So we, we use computing resources to process zeros. The other thing is that, uh, yes, uh, it, it, this approach could work for calorimeters that have a fi finite uh, uh, granularity. But if you want, for instance, to include the information from other subsystems, like the tracking information, which has a, a spatial resolution of micrometers, right, orders of magnitude, better resolution, is not very straightforward. So 
you you lose uh, information and the more natural natural representation is actually to represent the z as a sequence of particles a list of particles so this p1 p2 p3 are particles with uh, let's say with as using one property of each particle which is the energy so like this we used the full set of particles, so the full granularity of our uh, detectors and our event reconstruction. And then we apply similarly convolution techniques to exploit correlations between nearby particles. So instead of two dimensions in one dimension, I'm going to go faster. I put the equations here. I assume you, 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 you know about the convolution operation, right? We, we slide the kernel across the particles and we extract pictures. And then since we, have, we are dealing with lists, it's very easy to include more information. Go beyond the energy, include also information related to spatial information and other properties, right? So the key advantage of this approach with respect to, to, to images uh, is it allows you to explore the full detector granularity. You can include many more information. Uh, it's much more straightforward. And also it's more economical compared to two dimensions to images that uh, you use you use resources to process zeros and of course these techniques these tools are not uh, uh, only relevant for jet physics actually they were inspired on uh, language processing models you could use it in other topics of uh, of physics right now and with this new representation actually we managed to get an even another very important improvement with respect to jet images so this shown uh, with blue, I'm showing algorithms that have uh, based on particle sequence, one dimensional convolutional networks. The red one is based on the images and the pink one is based on high level uh, variables. So this was a game changer actually. And uh, we didn't say explicitly, but we use simulated data to develop and train the algorithm. So a very important test was actually the performance that we see in simulation is confirmed in data. So in this plot, for instance, it shows the response of the output of the one of these uh, uh, algorithms in simulation, which is in solid histograms and in actual collision data with black market. And here is the ratio. So you see a perfect agreement means once and one is at one. And this actually shows that the, the agreement with simulation data is, is, uh, is very good. So this gives us confidence, actually, to start using these techniques in analysis. Now, OK, we are here now. We have, it was, as I said, it was a game changer moving to low level information. Very striking game. Can we do better? So I didn't mention it explicitly, but uh, one important limitation of using, of representing a problem, like, for instance, a jet as a list, as a sequence of particles that we have to impose a human uh, chosen on ordering. So for instance, you can order particles based on the, ener the energy, right? However, this is not the most natural representation because the jet is an intrinsically unordered set of particles which have strong relationship between its particles. And this is true actually for most poor problems, not only in jet, but for instance, the protein structure, or you, you have Instagram or Facebook, you know, this is how we have very, you know, there are no ordering, increasing ordering. They are very sparse the data and have very regular structure. So, and there is actually a very hot topic in the AI community. Uh, for instance, uh, Google is using these uh, techniques for the self-driving car is the notion of point clouds. So objects are represented by and another set of points in space in the case of self-driving cars. And then these guys develop uh, algorithm techniques, usually machine learning based algorithms to group the points based on their proximity, based on the similarity for a specific uh, a task. So if you want to identify humans, you group points that uh, look like humans or they are humans ideally, right? Cars, etc. So. Inspired by this, we use point clouds for jet identification. So now the jet is represented as a cloud of particles. 
And the next question is how you learn, how we can learn from this representation. But one thing we need to have in mind that uh, because we don't want to change the response of the algorithm if we permute uh, uh, the Z constituents, right? So we need to develop functions, algorithms that are permutation, that are permutation invariant. And there has been several approaches. This is a very, very hot uh, topic. Of course, we, we don't have time to go over all of them today, but uh, we will flash a couple of them as uh, appetizer. So let's say one example is using the deep sets. I have a link here if you want uh, to find more information. Let's say this is our particle cloud, P1, P2, P6. These are the different particles of the dead. Let's say we have six particles. The green uh, numbers are different properties. It can be the energy, the type of the particle, etc. Right? We have the particle cloud here. And one approach is actually to, uh, to use for each particle, to use uh, the properties, use them as input to a dense network. This is the sketch here that uh, Jennifer described earlier. And then extract another set uh, of uh, features as uh, will, will be actually the output of the deep neural network, the dense network here. So you can think about it as a mapping from some physics-inspired uh, uh, properties to a latent space using these uh, dense networks. Now, before, what did I say? I said that we need actually to have to respect permutation invariant. So what we do, one uh, symmetric function is the sum. So what we do is actually we sum, um, we have the latent representation and we then sum uh, across uh, the features, right? The, the, the indices here, uh, over all the all the particles, okay. And then the last step is we want to exploit the correlations between the different particle features between the different particle properties, and this we use using a dense network. And then we have the out the classification. So this approach views the Z, but also you can actually translate what we're discussing here to your uh, research uh, topic in a more global uh, uh, way, right? And uh, for those that are more into the high energy, uh, in, you know, in high energy physics, depending on the input you use, we can have different flavors of this uh, algorithm. So we are going to discuss more about these things on the hands-on section. Now, another example is to represent the particle cloud as a graph, right? So each of these circles here, each of these particles is a vertex of the graph, right? And then the edges of the graphs are connections, are relationships, interactions between the different particles. So the next question is, of course, how we are going to build the graph. And one, let's say, trivial way would be to start connect, connecting all particles with each other. So we have a fully connected uh, graph. Of course, uh, this is very computationally expensive. Although there are techniques uh, recently, you know, techniques that have been recently developed that uh, are becoming, you know, this this approach is becoming much more efficient. But nevertheless, what is more commonly done is actually to connect uh, particles vertices after applying some criteria. For instance, we want to. Uh, select the K, like five, six, ten uh, closest neighbors in some uh, coordinate system, or connect particles that are within some distance. And, in, you know, given that we have uh, time constraints, this is one, uh, this is the approach we are going to use in the hands on section, or you, you name it, another criteria. Now, the third part is how to learn from this graph. And uh, as you will see later, actually, uh, instead of viewing the Z as a whole more globally, a more powerful way to learn is to uh, follow a hierarchical approach. First, we want to learn local structure. So you have a top decays to a B quark, a W boson, and the W boson almost immediately decays to two other quarks. So instead of looking at the particle cloud as a whole, first look at the identifying the individual quarks and the flavor of this quark, the type of these quarks. And then, so exploit first local information, local structure, and then go to more global one, like the presence of two, two, two quarks that uh, 
are consistent from the W decay or the presence of three quarks that are consistent with the top quark decay and so on. And an operation that, as I showed earlier when I was doing this historical overview, a convolution that is an operation that is traditionally powerful on exploring this local structure is a convolution operation. So you can find more details about this approach in, in this uh, link here. Now, if you have an image or uh, you know two-dimensional, one-dimensional image, you have a fixed grid. It's, you define a path, a kernel here, and you glide it across the image and you perform the convolution. This is easy. When you have a particle cloud, however, it's not very trivial, right? Because you, as you see here, we have irregular shapes and unordered sets. And uh, so it's not very obvious how you are going to define, define the convolution, the kernel, the paths here, right? And also on top of this, as I said, we need to respect permutation invariants when we perform the convolution operation. And a recent development that you can see here, or, or recent, I mean, a few years ago, like three, four years ago, to perform convolutions on point cloud uh, is uh, the approach I'm going to descri describe here and you could try in your research uh, project. It comes in three steps. The first step is to find the closest, uh, the nearest neighbors in some coordinate system. Let's say here we have one, two, four, five closest neighbor for each particle. And then the second step is to define the permutation invariant convolution operation. So first we define a function that generate edge features, so information, uh, pairwise information between the particles. And then we want to aggregate the features using a symmetric function. And in the case of the jet argument that uh, we are going to play with, uh, we use the average across, the, we take the average across all uh, neighbors. If you want, for those that like equations more, this can be uh, summarized, what I just said, in this probably more elegant uh, mathematical uh, form. P are the particles and J are the, you know, the neighbors of the particle under study. And then the last step is actually uh, to update the graph, right? Uh, after running this convolution. So you can think about it as mapping from one point cloud to another point cloud. So here there are, uh, yeah, these are different particles, potentially different particles. Now, uh, a simplified version of this will be developed uh, during the hands-on uh, session. And I'm showing this plot here actually to for you to appreciate how how active is this area of uh, of uh, research? So each line corresponds to different algorithms following different approaches. This is a rock curve. Of course, we cannot go over all of them today. So here I, I highlight with a red arrow uh, those that we are going to discuss uh, in the hands-on uh, section. And I think, yeah, I don't know how I'm doing with time. Probably, you know, just some very very quickly, just a summary for completeness. So this really revolutionized the deep learning techniques on low level information, revolutionized the jet identification and also many other tasks in high energy physics. Uh, but this is not the end, right? There are improvements, maybe not so striking improvements as I saw you earlier, but the, there are more advanced algorithms coming up with uh, are improving the performance, but also another area that we are uh, actually working actively and you could uh, work actively is how to improve the robustness of the uh, of the algorithms so to depend less on simulation details etc and uh, you know i think it's time i think it's better to skip this and and discuss uh, more about these topics during the hands-on section and i think uh, unless there are questions Matt, I think I, I will pass this to you, right? You will continue with the notebook from Jennifer. Yeah, I think so. Um, hopefully you can hear me again, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, okay. So I'm going to... Mm -hmm. I'm gonna share my screen again. Okay, cool. So you should see my browser window. Um, I wanted to say a couple of things before I get started. So the next part, is that I'm going to take you through a similar example as what Jennifer um, showed for the high-level DNN, um, but for the deep sets. 
taggers that Lucas talked about in the first part of his talk, and then I'm going to hand it back to Lucas, who will talk about training graph neural networks in the last part. So I'll try to be um, efficient with my time so that there's enough time to cover everything. Um, but I did want to mention while I was talking, um, a couple of the other things that we've put here for people who are following along at home. One is this file, which is called the handout, right? So basically, this is um, a summary of the hands-on session, what is in the different notebooks, in case you forget later, if you want to come back to this, um, and sort of a couple of remarks to try to keep you out of trouble if there are normal, uh, if there are a couple of things that you might bump into. Also, there are links here for going further. So if you think that this topic is interesting and you want to learn more about jet tagging at the LHC, um, you might want to look into some of the challenges from the LHC Olympics or other examples that are provided by some of the authors of the tools that we're using. So hopefully this is helpful to you. Um, moving on now to the deep sets network. So to remind everyone, actually, I think we should look at this picture again. So this is from um, this is a figure in the paper that was published where these deep sets techniques um, it was maybe not for the first time applied to particle physics, but um, this paper came along with uh, a sort of set of libraries and implementation of using this type of network in particle physics that is really convenient, and it's what we'll be um, talking about today. So this paper is actually by Patrick Kaminsky, Eric Metodiev, and Jesse Taylor, who was on the um, panel discussion on Monday, if you tuned into that. Um, and it's called Energy Flow Networks, Deep Sets for Particle Jets. So the idea with these networks as um, Lucas said is that we take our particles, treating them as a point cloud or an unordered set of particles, um, and we create a per particle representation with a dense network. Uh, so there's one network per particle. This can be uh, an unordered set of particles of variable length. So you don't have to have a fixed number of particles necessarily when you're doing this type of technique. Um, we sum all of these per-particle representations in the latent space, and then um, we have this sort of global representation um, F network, um, which would be, you know, sort of the output of the classifier. Um, there are two flavors of these networks that are used for particle physics. One of them is called an EFN, energy flow network, and the other one is called a PFN, a particle flow network. And the differences between them um, are a bit subtle. So I'll come back to that maybe when we're training, but for now I wanted to come into the same note notebook that we were using before, um, which is the notebook two um, for training. And here I've changed the tagger type to PFN at the top. So actually, if you set the tagger type in this notebook to any of these four options, um, the whole thing should run, except for this first cell, the first time you run it, of course, um, like we learned before. Um, so I'm going with PFN here, sort of skipping training and EFN on the fly. Um, the DNN option is also a sort of simple um, dense network, which just takes the constituents as inputs. Um, but there's none of this sort of latent space representation, um, the summing that goes on in the deep sets architecture, right? So it's it's a bit different, the particles are PT ordered there. Um, but each of these three are an example of a low level network like Lucas was talking about, where we just give it the constituents and sort of let the network learn from those instead of trying to distill it into an intermediate um, sort of information, like in the high level features that Jennifer was talking about. Okay, so that's finally done. Now I have to download the data, um, but that should be fast. Um, while I had the floor, I also wanted to talk about the pre-processing that we're applying for the um, low-level networks. So we're applying the same pre-processing to all of them. Those functions are defined in this block, um, and then they're called later on. So there's one for the constituents, which is the first function here, and then there's another one that pre-processes the high pre-processes the high-level features um, down below. Um, but there are a few things that we're doing to the jets. Um, when we before we want to show them to a neural network, just to make it easier for the neural network to learn what's important in the jets, right? 
So these jets could be all over the detectors. Um, you know, it could go into one place or another, and the coordinates that we usually use um, tell you where in the detector they go. That's not so important when we want to distinguish a top quark from a background jet. Um, and so the first thing we do is we shift all of the jet centroids to be centered at zero, zero. So this just puts them all in the same place. Um, we take special care um, to correctly account for the fact that phi, the azimuthal angle around the jet axis is um, periodic. And then we rotate the jet so that the second hardest constituent sits on the negative phi axis. So I can show you a picture of what I mean by that in a second. And then the third step that we do is we flip the jet if it's necessary so that the third hardest constituent is in the positive eta um, hemisphere. So this is a picture um, of the jets in the sample that we are using. Um, if you plot the eta and phi of all of the jets on top of each other, you get this kind of heat map. You can see the stripe going from top to bottom is from the rotation, where we put the second hardest constituent always um, below the first one, which is in the center. And then you can also see for the tops in this figure, uh, the lower right one, um, the right side of the figure is brighter than the left side. And this is from the flipping of the third constituent um, to be in this hemisphere. So we sort of take these symmetries out so that the network doesn't have to learn it itself. And this just makes the whole process faster. Um, very good. Um, we do similar sorts of pre-processing things for the high-level network as well. I won't get into the details right now, but uh, basically we normalize um, the different observables that are shown to be roughly between zero and one um, so that the network doesn't have to learn about different scales of numbers and things like that. Okay. Um, I may also decrease the number of jets that we're trading with. Um, just to 100,000 so that it goes a bit faster right now, as I think we only have a half hour left. We'll set up the network um, and the different signal and background symbols now. And then in this block, we'll configure the architecture. Um, so we're training a PFM. So I'm going to scroll down. Please um, also try to shout at me if I'm going too fast <laughs> or post in the chat or something if you get confused. Um, so here is the setup for the PFN. Um, so in this case, we show it basically different information about every particle. So the input um, dimensionality to the network, um, you know, we're sho showing it seven things per particle. Um, for the EFN, we would show it less, and I'll come back to that, but the input dimensionality is lower. Um, these settings, the phi sizes and the f sizes, just tell you about the, the details, how many nodes and layers um, go into the phi networks and the f network. So these are the per particle representation. And then the last one after the summing um, is performed. Um, you can play with these, although changing these settings tends not to alter the performance so much once you get something working well. Um, usually when I'm using this kind of network, I just use the default um, settings that are provided by the authors, and this works more or less well enough. Um, there is one thing that you can try to alter, which is the dimensionality of the latent space, um, which is the third. Uh, no, it's usually the last um, setting here. This is set up a little bit differently than I normally do it. Um, but that can actually have an effect on the network, um, but it's usually just one parameter that you need to scan, not uh, you know, a whole boatload of them. Um, everything else is pretty much stock. Um, it's using the binary cross-entry loss, loss again. Um, okay, so that's all set. We can train the tagger now. Um, and while the tagger is training, hopefully it doesn't take too long, um, but I wanted to also talk about why we might want to use this kind of network. Um, so Lucas introduced a few different kinds, um, and we've had sort of a historical perspective today about um, sort of the evolution of top tagging, right? We used to do it this way, then we started doing these 
um, low level particle based techniques and then lately we've been using graphs and the graphs are super powerful. Um, it is useful to understand how um, this field developed um, and also how the different types of networks um, have been applied in it. Um, also, sometimes it's useful to use something that isn't the absolute bleeding edge network if you just want to do a sort of basic study or something quick. So I really like PFNs and the deep sets approach um, because there's not really much that you have to fiddle with to get it working. It generally works out of the box. Um, with the graphs, there can be more overhead in constructing the graphs for the particles and getting it running um, can take a bit longer to get it set up. So sometimes you don't need to drive a race car, right? If you just need to go to the store to buy some milk. Um, if you just want to prototype or sketch something, I think a PFN in particular is a really good um, option. And then if you need extra performance, you can go to that later. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about just briefly, it's a bit of a non sequitur, is today we've been training always with 20 epochs in the networks. Um, that's sort of the default settings. You could go longer. You have to be careful not to overtrain, like Jennifer mentioned. Um, if you wanted to learn a bit more about how to do machine learning, uh, you know, more advanced, um, you might want to look up something called early stopping. Um, which would monitor the way that the loss changes between the different epochs and um, end the training when the network has basically reached a point that you think is saturated. Um, so this is a really convenient way to not have to fiddle with this if you're doing research, but it makes training a little bit um, unpredictable, right? Because the network will just continue being trained until it gets cut off by the early stopping. So we didn't do that today, um, but I would if I was using this network for my own work. Um, okay, so we have now the output with the PFN. I mean, this is ultimately going to look very similar to the high level DNN, right? So this is why we're spending a lot of time trying to get at the, the concepts that we're um, talking about today rather than the details of the different networks. Obviously the architecture is different, but um, the process of training it, the workflow um, is very similar. Um, good, so now we have the PFN trained. I'm happy to take any questions. I don't see any in the chat. Um, hopefully I have convinced you that sometimes the PFN um, is interesting. I guess I should also talk about um, what an energy flow network is very quickly before I head things back to Lucas. So in the PFN, no, oh, that's the wrong picture. We have this per particle representation. Um, and when we construct this, you know, in principle, we can tell these representations anything we want about the particle, right? You could give it Matt, not just its, yeah, sorry. All right, it's Rick here. I, uh, yeah. In the uh, Slack discussion, the general oh. Slack discussion, uh, one of our, uh, Toby, one of our viewers, uh, um, um caught an issue um ah, okay yeah, there we go uh just thought jennifer was handling it but uh, other people may um may want to see that just in case they hit the same problem that's in the general channel of the slack support this is for the work thank you jennifer okay, okay. yeah okay. i see that okay thank so you, that's for the next you, part baby. yeah 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 so this other file is uh, smaller so we can um i'll put that up too it might be better for the graphs um okay sorry other, anyway, otherwise we don't we don't have any questions oh hang on this sorry no, that a new, a, a new question just came into the chat uh so that's the zoom chat now from new one yes uh, it's on, um, so I, he's asking on early stopping yep i can see it so he asks uh or they ask um can you depend on early stopping entirely to avoid overtraining um do you need to check the model loss and validation loss and then decide the number of epochs to train. Um, so if I were training a network, I would rely on the early stopping to avoid overtraining. That's exactly what I would do. So I would configure it in a way that the training stops um, when the validation loss stops decreasing um, during the training, um, which I think is the typical thing um, that people do. Um, do you need to check the model loss and validation loss? Um, 
Yeah, so this basically does that for you and it stops it at a point where the network doesn't seem to be improving. Does that answer your question? The other thing you could do is just figure out when that happens and then train for that many epochs, right? But uh, if you can set it up to clip the training off um, at the best time, then it is just easier to let it do that, I think. Cool, okay. Um, Right, so I was just quickly talking about the difference between an EFN and a PFN. So with the particle flow network, we can show it basically any um, information about the particles that we want. With an EFN, this is a bit of a theoretical um, distinction that's made, um, but the weights inside the network are weighted by the energies of the particles, and also these show the network less information per particle. Um, the reason that this is done is because soft particles in QCD are less well understood. Um, so we don't have a perfect understanding of all of the dynamics of jet formation. Um, Lucas was getting at this at the end of his talk. Um, and so we model these things, but the models don't necessarily agree with each other. For instance, the number of protons that get produced inside of a jet can make macroscopic properties of the jet quite different, actually, experimentally. Um, and so if we want to avoid being sensitive to certain things that we don't understand, like the effects of soft radiation, um, we can weight the nodes in the network with the energy of the particles, and then the soft ones sort of remove themselves from the network. Um, the performance of EFNs tends to be worse than PFNs because you remove information by doing this, but the hope is that you remove um, the information that you understand the least and that you're left with something that you can trust a bit more. So if you are working in this area, it's a bit of a specialized thing, but they can be very useful. Um, and understanding the difference in performance between an EFN and a PFN can be very useful. Um, hopefully that was clear, um, but I think with that, I will hand it back to Lucas to talk about graphs now in the last part. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, let me start the notebook. Um, do I have it? Sorry, guys, just a second to find it. It's here. It's here. Okay, so you have it up, I guess. Uh, so here for this, for graph networks, we are going to use another uh, library. It's called PyTorch. It's design more to make like uh, uh, designing a, a graph neural networks a bit easier. So as usually the first uh, step is to to set up uh, you know all the necessary pieces, import libraries and so on. So this should take uh, maybe a minute or so. <clears throat> Um, yeah, you know, in general, while we're waiting, uh, when running things, you can ask uh, questions. Uh, um, on the topics we discussed. So this is PyTorch and PyTorch geometric. Uh, those are the things you need. Uh, for instance, the spider geometry is going to get the, uh, the, the the functions to do the convolution in graph neural networks. Then we need to load the data. So I, Matt mentioned it. I did the, a quick and dirty uh, standardization. So I moved the uh, features to have a mean, translate the feature to have a mean around zero at zero and uh, a standard deviation of one. This is done in an automatic fashion. In real life, you may have to fine tune it a bit. In any case, to see the importance and the performance, uh, there is a, a flag here that you can turn false or true, depending if you do not or want to do standardization. Here we load the data set and then create the graph. So as I said during my talk, a quick way because this process can take a bit of time and a small tip because you are doing random access of uh, of the particles you it's better in real time in real life uh, 
they said you should do it in CPUs, this and do the training on GPUs, which are better because you can parallelize the process. So what we are doing here, yes. Rick, is there a question? Okay, I guess not. So um so the, what we want here is we want to build connections between the particles between you know the the vertices of the graph and uh, we don't want to do a, a full uh, a fully connected graph so we connect between uh, particles between vertices that are within some uh, distance defined by the the coordinate that this was discussed earlier by by Jennifer right so for instance this is a parameter this is just a kind of a, some choice you can play with this parameter and see how they affect the performance and the other thing is because typically jets have up to or you can have 200 uh, particles in the interest of time one could include all particles for this problem uh, we are going to use much less like 10 particles so you don't uh, you know this is just to show you how to write the code and, and, and experiment with it not the absolute performance so what is done here, the other thing that I would like to, to highlight here is what we call padding, because not all jets have the, um, have, uh, the same number of uh, constituents. So we pad them, we pad them with zero. So we assume we have like, if I ask for 20 particles and they're not always 20 particles and we have 18, is going to artificially assume I mean, that they are 20 particles, but they are going to be filled with zero, so it will not really matter in the training. They're not going to impact the training. So to so create that graph. And then here we define the graph neural network model. So these are the GCN cone is actually the lighter flavor of the convolution operation that I described in my slides. Right, find the key in neighbors, create edge information, and then aggregate this information uh, using a symmetric function, which could be an average or a, a maximum for this. You can play, Rick, it, it, you're trying to say something? No, no, okay. sorry. No problem. So, and so we define the graph neural network model here. And then the other thing, usually it's useful to try to visualize if you can, also to debug it and understand, because this is getting a bit complicated to visualize your graph. So uh, we added a few lines here that uh, uh, would allow you to plot the different connections. And you can play with these things. You can, uh, you know, uh, you can use some masking, like you want to see, uh, in case you have noise, for instance, you can plot the edges that you want to that are useful in your problems uh, vertices that are uh, coming from noise and so on so so here yeah i'm loading the data i'm creating the graph yes no this will be shown later the the plot so this will take a few minutes because now we are using the function that I discussed earlier to build the graph. So just to be very fast, we only we are going to link connect vertices that are within a distance of 0 0.4 in the coordinates like rapidity and azimuth angle, but it doesn't matter for this case. Now you can do whatever. And we are going to use up to 10 particles. Usually in these problems, we are going to use 100 in real life, we use 100 particles. here we're going to plot let me run it again i just was just testing the code these are two examples two graphs so it's kind of cool to see nice to see that uh, this is one jet you see that actually you create it this is that all constituents like goes up to nine ten because it starts counting at zero you see that you build connections for those that are very close by this the nine one is actually far and it's not connected so this is not great it's not the most the best way so that's why since it's a school uh, one of the exercises you should do when we finish is to try to replace the delta r uh, connection um, requirement with a k and n so 
and you feel free to ask me if you have any questions so because this particle could be relevant for the problem we are uh, we want to solve this is another example so you see these guys that are very close to each other they are connected these two because of the requirement we have they are not connected but could be relevant okay then as discussed we create a set of training data set the testing data set and a validation data set some uh, Things that it doesn't matter you can do use the, these guys here as a recipe you define the batch size uh, uh, how you split the testing and the training data sets so they are orthogonal and so on these are things that you you, you could completely inherit from this code here and this part actually uh, has initializes uh, the graph neural network here we put actually the neural network would, would tell to the algorithm actually to use uh, uh, with CUDA to use uh, GPUs because this is a highly parallelizable uh, procedure here. And these are some details of the, for instance, this is the learning rate. So these are hyperparameters. A second exercise that you could do is, for instance, instead of uh, having a fixed uh, learning uh, rate, to decay, to change the, the learning rate as a function of the number of vertex. Okay, so this is a second exercise that you should do after this lecture. Then we define the evaluation function. These are things that also discussed earlier by Matt and, and Jennifer. I think this you can skip. There are just some uh, plotting things just to ensure that things are going correctly. I'm plotting the label, so it should be zero and one. We have a binary classifier. If you see something not zero or one, there is a bug somewhere. And the most interesting part is actually uh, to train the model. Now, don't be super excited because, as I said, you know, I'm using here a very simplified uh, version of the graph, like just 10 particles and I'm training for 10 epochs. The whole idea here is to, or even less than, yeah, five epochs. So this is the idea is to, to, to see, to have a working example on how to build a graph, how to visualize a graph, etc. And uh, here, because, you know, there are sometimes, you know, you may end up in a local minimum or uh, there are challenges. What a, a trick that usually we do is actually to evaluate, to keep, you can have fluctuation if you have uh, limited uh, statistics, is to keep the the epoch that produces uh, the the best uh, the the lowest loss I mean is the most sensitive um, uh, gives the lowest uh, loss in the validation data set so this is the, the best model effectively you have the best training and this is what uh, this code uh, uh, does uh, here it evaluates using the best uh, model. It's not so uh, not so great, as I said, the performance, but it doesn't matter for now. It's also you can uh, play, you can improve, you can make a deeper network and include more uh, jets. It's just 10,000 jets. In the previous example, we we're using, I don't know, 100,000 or more jets. And then the last thing is actually to save the output, the training, uh, and include it in the in a function that uh, in another notebook that uh, is named, uh, how is named? This one, the plotting one. So, okay, so this, okay, we did the first uh, uh, pass of, uh, you know, of developing a, a graph neural network, some uh, uh, tips and tricks on how to train it and, uh, and the training is all. So if you have questions, I'm happy to discuss them. Otherwise, I, I don't know how much time we have or we are, are we planning to plot and compare the different algorithms or Jennifer and Matt, how would you like to do it? Yeah, I think that would be good. Um, mm -hmm. I can quickly go through that sure. just so you can see the results. Um, I, I've, I was quickly doing this while you were talking and I realized um, that my... Uh, Graph neural network is not very good, probably. Due it, it's it's very bad. I mean, yeah. this is not because I just wanted to run exactly. over. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, exactly. Yeah. But 
You guys um, think about as a challenge to improve it later, okay? I just uh, because we, we can. We have like, we have nine minutes at this stage. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So I was just going to quickly go through the the last notebook. Um, it's not training anything. Uh, if you haven't saved all of the neural nets, um, you can either copy them into your main drive or you can just run it. it if they aren't all there, it's fine. Um, so I've just run all of this, but uh, so I can rerun it again. Um, the first bits are just downloading all the files that you were using before, et cetera. Um, not so exciting. Um, but yeah, here, the point of this, this uh, notebook is just to compare the performance uh, across these different taggers. Um, like we've mentioned multiple times now, uh, some of the ways that we're training them or the inputs to these data sets, it's not optimal. Um, we, for like the graph neural nets, you would typically use a lot more um, events and you would use, um, you know, larger radius that you would scan over. So this is not going to be necessarily indicative of how well they'll behave, but I think it's useful to keep in mind. So the first thing we'll plot is just the tagger scores for the signal in the background. So you can see, you know, compared to the jet mass, a lot of these taggers have better performance. Um, they're able to kind of distinguish a little bit better the signal in the background. The GNN, like I said, uh, there are some, I think it, it's, it's just not working very well with what we're giving it. Um, so the signal in the background look quite similar, so it's not going to perform very well. Um, and then we can just go ahead from that to make the rock curves that we have talked about already. Um, and yeah, what you can see here is that, yeah, there's kind of some ordering of these. Um, you can compare this, I think you should compare this to the what Lucas showed in his talk. Um, with the different neural networks, um, as well as the ones in the um, the the paper or the note that's linked at the top of um, these slides, um, or one of these slides at least, um, or these notebooks at least, um, that uses these taggers. But yeah, you can see that there are there's a clear distinction between the different types of taggers. Um, aside from the GNN, which we've already mentioned why there are problems, um, the all of them do much better than just the mass itself. Um, yeah, and, uh, you can see that, you know, the high level DNN is doing a little better than the DNN, but, uh, you know, so having lower level in, or lower level information doesn't necessarily get you improved performance, but, um, for instance, the PFN, um, which does have this lower information, it, it does significantly outperform just using these high level features that we've defined. Um, so yeah, I think we encourage you all to play with the different parameters in these to try your own data sets. Um, but I think that's, um, you know, this is a, at least a baseline for how you can compare the performance of the, the different taggers that you're producing to try to play around to get the best, um, taggers that you can. I think that's all from my end. That was a very quick, just show how plotting works. Yes. Um, I'm any questions, um, please, if people want to use the meeting chat, um, if you want more persistence on a question, use the Slack system, um, especially for technical issues. Um, if, if nobody has any further questions, unless the speakers want to make um uh any further points we could we could draw to a close do, do, is there is there any summary items i i, I mean we're, we're at time now so no need if you don't want to but um is there anything you'd like to say at this point so we so, didn't yeah. have anything else prepared um no, no. please is... please do play with the networks and uh yeah if you get stuck reach out to us you have many options for how to do that <laughs> so take your pick um, hopefully you have fun. Um, I think this is a really fun problem to try to solve in creative ways. So, you know, do play with it. Yeah, but that's all we had. No, thank you. Well, look, Jennifer, Matt, Lucas, thank you so much for all your work. Um, um, and thank you to the, um, all the participants in uh, this morning's workshop. We will be doing it all again at 2 p.m. Eastern. So, um, please. You know, go away whichever time zone you're in. Have you have your respective um, 
opportunity to to uh, eat, <laughs> take a break, and then uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, this, this afternoon. And thank you very much uh, again to everybody participating. So we're going to stop the recording at that point and end the Zoom. You can still reach uh, us interactively via Slack, uh, and we'll open up the uh, works workshop at 2 p.m. Eastern again this afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you.